Okay, well, thank you. Uh, I'm in that enviable spot. Reminds me of uh, Hee Haw, you know, good news, bad news. Uh, you've all woken up from your post-lunch nap, but now I'm hold holding you back from your, your snack. So uh, I'll try and talk and hold your interest for a little while. But uh, really what's happening here, and I'd like to acknowledge John Laurie and Marcia Shannon from the University of Missouri, and I guess we could put Joel Derushi up up there too. The reason that Joel's in, in there is a uh, the National Swine Nutrition Guide came out in 2012, and in the National Swine Nutrition Guide spreadsheet, it actually calculates manure value, but it calculates it after the manure or after the ration has been optimized. And we decided that maybe it should be uh, the ration should be optimized, including that manure value. And so we've been trying to uh, to do that, and that's really this talk is to kind of explain what's been happening in tr terms of introducing manure value into the optimization uh, decision. So uh, the summary, or just kind of what I'm wanting to present today, is that manure has become a significant source of value, and uh, I'll show that. Uh, it's moved from a waste product to a co-product in livestock production. And just the last presentation was saying how much money you could be making if you uh, use your manure wisely. And so uh, we're looking at it as a co-product, which is a very different decision from an economic perspective than just as a, a waste product. Uh, there are opportunities to, integ uh, to integrate the value of manure into the least cost uh, decision so that net income is optimized. Uh, again, it's just where are your boundaries as far as the amount of money that you're wanting to, uh, to look at. We wanted to expand the boundary a little bit. And the caveat, I'm going to show that it can make more money, but, I, but the caveat is whenever you increase the value or the cost of your diet, that is money out of your pocket. Whenever you increase the value of manure, that is potential income if, in fact, you use the manure uh, to its fullest. And so I'll show you where we think we can integrate it into the decision. Uh, but we must actually use the manure value if we integrate it into the decision. So uh, going back to just the source of it, or the, the value of manure. Iowa State University says that the cost of producing a, a market hog in 2012 is this, composed of this. But they said that you're going to lose $11, almost $12 a head for every hog you fed in 2012. It just so happens that the value of manure in 2012 was about $12 a head. So if you did look at it as a co-product, you broke even, which is what you really want to do. Uh, if you looked at it just as, I'm a hog raiser, I'm not a hog raiser and a manure uh, manager, uh, you lost money. So uh, what happens in a typical situation is that you minimize the ration cost subject to some nutritional constraints. You find the least cost a combination of all these different feedstuffs that meet the dietary needs of the animal. What we're wanting to say is just within that optimization routine, we are minimizing ration cost, but we're taking out the value of the manure. So any increased value of manure that might come with an increased ration cost would be lowering that. And so the objective is no longer to just have the least cost ration formulation, but it's the net value of ration and the manure. So let's look at uh, some of the reason that this, I think, is becoming important. Uh, manure value is increasing as fertilizer prices are increasing. DDGs have entered into the diet, and uh, there is no increased cost for optimizing manure value. We're not talking about more tons or gallons spread. We're just talking about the concentration within the tons or the gallons that are going to be spread. So uh, I've got some feed and fertilizer prices here just to, to get you thinking. Uh, we, uh, we studied this over the 10-year period of 2002 to 2011. If you look at the price of corn, it went from a little under $100 to uh, over 200, a two and a half time increase in that uh, time period. If you look at soybean meal, it went from 250 to, to almost 500, a little under two, twice uh, increase. Uh, DDGs increased a, a little bit less than corn. 
uh, but you, you saw anywhere from a two to a two and a half time increase. What did you see with fertilizer prices? Fertilizers went from about 100 to 300. You saw a three time increase for nitrogen. For phosphorus, you saw uh, almost a four time increase. For potassium, a three and a half time increase. In other words, the nutrients in the manure are, have increased at a faster rate than the ingredients in the feed. And so that says, should we be considering this as a joint product? So here's the uh, kind of the importance of DDGs, or I'm sorry, the importance of manure value. I'll get to DDGs in a minute. Uh, when we ran our, when we had an optimization of the diet, over on the left-hand side, we have the different diet cost uh, for those 10 years. And then using the National Swine Nutrition Guide, this was the manure value. One of the things that I need to really bring to your attention uh, here is uh, the manure value is on dollars per ton of feed. Uh, whenever you're listening to a, an economics on manure, you need to know what the units are. Is it per acre, per animal unit? The last time, last speaker said, value per animal. Because we're trying to integrate this into the feed value, we're looking at the manure value per ton of feed fed because it's going to be optimized in that way. The important thing is from 2002 we were almost 10 percent of the uh, diet cost could be recovered in manure. Now 14 percent uh, can be. It's just a, another way of looking at those price increases I showed you uh, the last slide is manure is becoming a more important co-product. Now here's the thing what's happening with DDGs over the last 10 years. Uh, the important thing on this slide is this, uh, this is with DDGs allowed in the diet, this gold uh, line. If we, allow, if we said no, we're not going to feed DDGs, we would be in this blue line. And so the DDGs then, as a percent of the ration cost, were, were down here. I mean, if we, if we did not allow DDGs, we had a higher ration cost. It split in 2006, and that's really the, the, the thing that we want to look at. Why did it split in 2006? There are perhaps some economic reasons, but it's going to give us an insight into some of the analysis that I show you here in a minute. This is our results, and I should say that uh, the results are still in flux, but these are our, 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 our results of, at, at this time. Looking at it from 10 years perspective, uh, over here on the, the far left, we have manure is not in the optimization routine. That's what OR stands for, the optimization routine. Over here, the manure is in the optimization routine. And so we're asking, what is the net cost of the diet? The net cost is its ration cost, and we subtract out the manure value from that. And uh, then we have the savings. So, you know, just looking at 2006, we're saying that the, the ration cost $136 if we did not allow manure in our optimization routine. $139, I'm sorry. If we allowed manure in our optimization routine, the net ration cost reduced to $130, so we had an $8.41 savings. So over here in this column, there are three years in which there's no change at all. Zero change. There's several years in which there's less than a dollar change. There's this one year in which there's a lot. What I want to do is draw your attention to the bold years, 2006 and 2009, and uh, see if those have some insight into why we want to try and think about incorporating uh, manure value into our optimization routine. So here's the diet cost by itself. I mean, this is, manure's not in here yet. But again, I have, I allow manure to be optimized, all right. My feed ration optimized without manure considered, my feed ration with manure considered. In 2006, I had a $1.76 more expensive ration when I considered manure in the optimization. Uh, and it's always more expensive in a ration, always, or it's never below zero, I should say. 
So I'm never going to have a less expensive ration when I consider manure in the optimization routine. So usually it's quite small. Sometimes it's, uh, it's rather large. Uh, but in this particular 2006, which I'm interested in, and in 2009, which I'm interested in, uh, we had a $1.76 more expensive ration, or really zero, it must be a half a penny or something because of the way it comes out, but uh, no change in the ration cost. So uh, this again is a graphical representation of the value of manure uh, with it in, the, in it and in the optimization and not in the optimization. I'm going to look at 2006 and 2009. 2006, it actually looks very good. I should be doing it. 2009, it's a little bit of an imp improvement, but should I, should I do it is the question. So let's look at 2006. In 2006, this was my uh, ration. The top line is manure is not considered in the optimization routine. The bottom line is I allowed manure to be in the optimization routine. And I might just mention one of the reasons that this is still in a state of flux is the, when you include manure in the optimization routine as it currently sits, it is a non-linear optimization, which is not really very much fun. Uh, linear optimization is more enjoyable. We, we think we have figured out how to make it linear. So uh, that's why this may be uh, easier to do in the future. But anyway, manure is not in the optimization routine in 2006. The kind of the thing that stands out is your DDGs. Remember how DDGs all of a sudden separated in 2006? There was some type of price differential that was going on. Uh, if you allow manure in the optimization routine, it put in at 40%, which was our maximum amount. We would not allow more than 40%. Also, just for the animal scientist in the room who would think this is very important, <laughs> Uh, we are looking at a 50 to 100 pound pigs because uh, as we, we also did this for 200 to 250 pound pigs and we lowered the amount of DDGs that were permitted in the ration. But anyway, the interesting thing here is DDGs came in the ration very strong uh, when we allowed them, in, when we allowed manure in the optimization routine. So I want to look at the cost now. So again, I'm showing the fir these first three columns are kind of the ingredients over here. My net cost, I actually increased, or I decreased that cost a little over $8. So it was $8 cheaper per ton of feed fed. My diet, on the other hand, went up a little over $2, $1.75. And that is coming straight out of the feeder's pocket. That is a real cost. He's going to incur a buck seventy-five more. On the other hand, his manure value went from twenty-one to thirty-one, where it increased ten dollars. So he's got almost an eight-dollar or almost a ten-dollar value of increase in manure, or seven and a half to eight-dollar total net. So if, in fact, in 2006, he was capturing the entire value of his manure, he only had to put down a buck seventy-five to get ten dollars back. But if he was not capturing the value of that manure, if he was not really using it, he's putting that buck seventy-five down and not capturing that full ten. So I, I just want to make sure that we understand. When you pay for the feed, you pay for the feed. When you hopefully, hopefully get money out of the manure, you've got to put it on properly. So 2006, that was the situation. DDGs entered the, the ration at a much higher level, provided extra phosphorus, and uh, went with it. Let's go to 2009. In 2009, again, manure is not in the optimization routine up in the set first column. It is in the second column. For the most part, the corn, soybean, and DDGs are similar. What happened is phytase came into, or I should say, phytase was in it when we were not considering manure. Phytase got kicked out when we were considering manure. So a, a least cost ration formulation would have said, feed a little bit of phytase. 
And we're saying, no, don't feed that phytase in 2009. So again, I just show over there my phytase and monocal have changed a little bit. But my net diet cost, my net cost uh, is $1.32 to 62, about 60 cent difference. So I'm saving 60 cents by including manure in the optimization routine. How much does it cost me out of my pocket by fee? I'm only, it's only costing me a penny. See, that's the, the interesting thing about a linear program, uh, an optimization. It's going to zero in on the least cost. And on this least cost, it saves you a penny by going for phytase. And I go, so? Do, do you really see a penny? Now, maybe if you're feeding hundreds of thousands a ton, a penny does make a difference. But at this point, it looks like it's not very much difference. On the other hand, I'm getting about 60 cents increase in manure value by not feeding phytase and going ahead and feeding a, another phosphorus source. So there, here's a situation in which the cost did not really increase, but the value did just by not feeding phytase. So uh, we think there are opportunities, whether or not uh, there's sufficient opportunities to, to do it is, a, is still a question that we're not sure we have answered. So the take home message. I think manure does need to be considered as a co-product and uh, not as a waste product. If in fact it is a co-product, you manage it for profit maximization just like you would anything else. Um, including manure in the feed optimization routine can decrease the cost. We've seen that it de uh, decreased the cost 7 out of 10 years. Some of it not very uh, significantly, but it did 7 out of 10 years. Uh, it usually increases the actual diet cost by some amount. It always uh, it increases in the actual diet cost is always realized. Increase in the, the value of manure is less certain. So don't include it in the optimization de uh, decisions without a high probability of realizing the value of manure. And uh, with that, I'll call it quits and see if there's any questions. Yeah, yes. Um, I assume you're talking about the nutrient content in the pit yep. right yeah. after excretion? No. Uh, we have the, we were using pit slurry, but with nitrogen we had volatilization in the pit and we had volatilization in the land application product, uh, portion of it. So uh, we were taking into account how much was time available. Yeah. I think I heard you say that you were assuming the cost of applying the manure was the same, the to same total amount of manure, same application cost. That's right. But for a lot of Iowa producers anyway, to get the full value out of the P and K in the manure, they may have to haul it farther away from the building than they would otherwise. And I'm not sure I would say that's a safe assumption that a, a manure applicator will be willing to apply it for the same price per gallon if he has to take it three miles away from the building rather than half a mile away from the building. Well, uh, you're right. If, if we are increasing the concentration, so let's say we have a thousand gallons of manure, uh, if we're increasing the concentration, particularly of phosphorus, but also of nitrogen if we're feeding DDGs, uh, we may have to spread it over instead of 40 acres, 50 acres. Yeah, th that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, the soil test phosphorus and potassium levels close to the building are high enough that there's no economic return for putting phosphorus and potassium there. So the value return to the producer is zero for the P and K that goes there. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to get it to a field that has low testing P or K to get any economic return for P and K. Yeah. And that's why I said you have to get the value of the manure. And if you're putting it on a soil test high in P or K, you're not getting the value of the manure. John, we know. also have in the in the approach that we're doing, you set those numbers. So if you're only thinking you're going to get, yeah. you can set up in other words, those are adjustable in the spreadsheet. Those are adjustable numbers. Right. As you're saying, that you have, have to know which field it's going to before you can optimize. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Back there. Kind of along those same lines. I definitely agree with the premise. But if you're, for example.
No, we are assuming the volume in the manure pit is the same. And so if that volume is significantly higher, then there will be a there will be an increased cost if the if you've got more volume in the pit. One last question. 